All right, thanks very much. Well, thanks everybody for coming to Gender and Minority Imbalance in the Practice of Archaeology. This is our uh, Pika Kucha presentations followed by discussion. I'm sorry to say that one of our speakers has had to drop out at the last minute for family emergency, but rest assured they send their apologies. So it's a shame can't be here, but what can we do? Um, just a little bit in advance of the presentations, a little bit about this style of presentation. It's 20 slides <coughs> shown for 20 seconds each, so they're going to be very short, snappy presentations. So hopefully we'll get all of those really important points out and uh, we'll be able to just go with some very interesting discussion. So we'll see. The discussion will follow. Um, the only thing I would ask is no shaming and no blaming. If you disagree with the point, I'm quite happy for people to have polite disagreements, but we don't want any firefights in the room. We're all quite flammable. <coughs> Because I felt it was absolutely necessary, I thought I'd just provide a little bit in the way of trigger warnings because I don't know the full contents of everybody's presentation. Um, expletives have not been deleted, at least from what I have to say. Um, we may be discussing issues of sexual or other harassment, bullying, or discrimination in the workplace. So if this does have a psychological impact on you, please feel free either to say or to step out as needs required. <clears throat> so just a little bit about me. Um, I'm hosting the session, but I'm afraid I don't have an actual talk to give. Um, I finished my PhD at Edinburgh University. I'm American, and I have Inuit ancestry, which is the people I in the corner of the American one. I spent seven years living in Scotland, and now I live in <clears throat> central England. So a range of places to call home. <clears throat> I am what society considers neurotypical, um, cis female, uh, white and other mixed background heritage from a predominantly working class upbringing and still quite working class, if you don't mind me saying. <clears throat> I've worked in a pretty wide range of industries, as you can see. Um, I have my PhD now, which I suppose is quite a white collar thing to obtain, but in the past I've worked as a professional diver, police officer, a car test driver, uh, forked tow trucks. So I've worked in a pretty broad range of industries. So I feel like hopefully um, some of those broad and vast experiences will help to unpick some of the uh, threads of sort of imbalances that we see all across the workplace of archaeology today. Um, because this, this is a real issue, at least it is for me, um, to just speak very, very plainly about my own experiences um, and again, there is a little bit of vulgar language here, so my apologies in advance. I have been called too lame to be, an under, to be in underwater archaeology because I'm a woman, and that's the reason that was very explicitly said. I have been called a pathetic woman for wanting a career in underwater archaeology, and this is told to me by a more senior mentor who is also an underwater archaeologist. If they ever recorded this, people would be going to jail left, right, but of course it's all more insidious than that. You never get caught. Um, I am a woman who could never be a diver, because that is, quote, a man's world. And I'm also the woman who is in my current job role as a project officer, um, because an under, as an underqualified man stated, it's because I have boobs. So congratulations to me for once in my life being a woman worked in my favorite scenes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> bonus for me. But I don't really want this to be about me personally, because while I can wax quite lyrically about my own experiences in the workplace and how I feel it's unfair, what I want that to flag up is that this is a reality. This isn't just um, a few people having a beef on Facebook or tweeting, oh, this guy was a bit unfair today. These are things that were actually specifically said to me. The list is very long, and I wouldn't dare to repeat it in polite company, but the list goes on and on, and I imagine that if these are the things being said to me, somebody who's neurotypical, straight, cis, female, um, I can imagine that there are a lot of people out there who are getting a lot more of it than I am, um, and I think that that's something that needs to be discussed quite openly. It's unfortunate that so many people don't want to have that discussion. As I was saying to Doug before the talk started, <clears throat> I asked a variety of co-workers and colleagues from across the heritage sector um, if they would want to join us today for this, this discussion or if they wanted to co-present. Some had concerns about it sullying the reputation of their partners, husbands, spouses, or other family members. Some of them were concerned about the effect it would have on their actual reputation in archaeology, which I think is fair, I think that it could, within the right context, have some type of effect on the reputation. 
but at the same time that's a real shame because we know that there's nothing in the world that's been gained if we haven't been willing to fight for it. So I choose to allow my reputation to be solid a little bit and have the discussion anyway. To set a little bit of that uh, drop data, we're under some relatively damning statistics. We know that research staff at the university level is around 90% female, but the professoriate is at less than 10% female. So there's some type of a strange dynamic shift happening when you cross over from research staff to professorial staff. Within the management sector in heritage, we're at less than 10% women. Um, within some of the workplaces I personally have worked within the commercial sector, you, you'll see far more women than men in a standard commercial workplace. Um, in the past, I've worked for one company where 70% of the staff were women. Unfortunately, 0% of the staff made up the upper management. So again, there's something very wrong going on here. How can we be fully staffed by women, managed purely by men, and minorities have been largely unacknowledged or simply not present at all, barring invisible disabilities that I've not been made aware of. Minorities in archaeology less than, make up less than 1% of archaeologists. LBGTQ, again, less than 1%, which is also a shame. Um, and people with disabilities, less than 2%. So again, this is a problem across the board. And this tells me not only there's a problem for, for women specifically, but this is a problem for women. This is for a problem for people with disabilities, invisible and visible. And it's a problem that isn't going to go away anytime soon, at least. And I don't think that it's necessarily about getting special treatment as a woman, because personally, I don't want special treatment I, I, at all. But I do want the heritage sector to acknowledge that women within the upper tiers of archaeology and heritage management are underrepresented. And that's a problem, because if women are underrepresented, we're not interpreting the data the same way, perhaps, and opportunities aren't fair. But this is the same for minority groups as well. Why are minority groups so grossly underrepresented? Is it actually by choice or is it purely by chance? And in either case, are we obliged to do something about it? I would suggest we would, but I'll leave that to you. So it's not about special treatment. It's about making the same goal attainable for everybody, regardless of how they identify themselves, if they have a disability, and if they're within a minority sector or not. So without further ado, I'd like to have David come on up and give his talk while I reload.